restoration doesn't mean one or two big conservation projects around the world. It means millions of local communities becoming economically empowered by the biodiversity they depend on. That is a global restoration movement. Biodiversity underpins the ecological balance that sustains us all. Scientists estimate that this is now being lost at a thousand times the natural rate. And as conservation efforts evolve, a vital component of these ecosystems could be being overlooked. Soil is the biggest carbon sink on land and supports the most biodiversity on Earth. It's also the system that's providing all the nutrients for all the plants that we eat, and it's just fundamental to the existence of every species on the planet. And if you look below, is an unbelievable wealth of life down there. The top layer of soil on our planet is not just vital to grow the food we eat, but it also plays an important role in the intricate balance of above and below ground ecological systems. This has been degraded worldwide at a staggering rate, largely due to unsustainable agriculture, ongoing deforestation and climate change. Humans have always valued individual parts of nature above everything else. Those tend to be the parts that we can use for food or timber or medicines or any other product, you know, fabrics, textiles. But when we value individual parts, we propagate those parts at the expense of everything else. Professor Tom Crowther heads up the Crowther Lab, a team of scientists at Research University ETH Zurich in Switzerland. His group is taking a big picture approach to understanding the holistic structure of global ecosystems. What's the problem with the world's soils today? So, soils are one of the most underrated and underappreciated resources on our planet. They provide all of the food and nutrition that we need to survive. They lock away tons of carbon. They help us with pandemic prevention. They are fundamental to life. And yet, we are degrading our soils at massive scales. We are unfortunately also warming the planet, and that is putting an additional strain on our soils. So when we warm the planet, carbon gets released from those soils, and it turns from a, a vibrant living ecosystem almost into a dying one. Zurich's impressive biodiverse forests were a key factor in attracting Tom to bring his life's work to the city. When nature is allowed to thrive, you get a wide mixture of different types of species above ground, and that is matched below ground. You get a diversity of organisms below ground. This soil harbors probably millions of different species of bacteria, archaea, fungi, and these are all the organisms that collectively lock away carbon to help us with climate change. They also, they mineralize nutrients so that plants can grow. Like these things. Yeah, so what are we looking at here, Tom? Often when people think about fungi, they think about mushrooms that you see above ground, the beautiful, multicolored, wonderful things that sometimes we can eat. But actually, the vast majority of the fungus exists below the soil in millions and millions of strands of what we call mycelium. And this is a mycelial network growing out into the soil from this wood. And this is distributed throughout the entire forest system. Thousands of these interacting networks that essentially provide all the nutrients for plants to grow, and they're also locking away carbon. It's a fully dynamic living system. I love how all these patterns repeat themselves in nature. You know, that can be like a lung or like a vein system. Exactly. There's all these systems. It's like any network. We, we couldn't have the internet without vast networks of nodes and interactions in the same way we can't have nutrient flow and distribution throughout living forests without these networks. Yeah, we've got a whole underground internet going on. Yeah. So what happens when that gets disrupted? Unfortunately, when we disrupt it at scale, so if we were to cut down all of these trees, light would come in, drying out the soil, these fungi wouldn't be able to survive in the way they, they do now. And when you disrupt that system, you then fragment the forest. And that means both of the two remaining patches of forest function in a completely different way. They're not able to survive and thrive in the way that they did when they were all connected. Deforestation is advancing at a staggering 100,000 square kilometers each year. 
not only destroying forests, but also the fertile soil, which is a key player in carbon storage. Will you explain the soil system to me? How does the soil lock away carbon? Actually, it's interesting. We've recently had a paradigm shift in our understanding of how soils store carbon. We used to think it was all from leaves that come from plants, and those leaves decompose, and some of the carbon gets just doesn't get decomposed. What we're realizing now is that actually a large proportion of it does get decomposed by microbes. And those microbes respire some of the carbon into the air, but they also lock some of it away in their biomass. And then the next group of microbes degrades them and degrades them and degrades them. And eventually that carbon gets into finer and finer and finer locations in the soil where it gets locked away in mineral part associated with mineral particles and it can stay there for tens or even thousands of years. Wow, look at all these mushrooms. <laughs> yeah. There's loads of them. This is a beautiful indication of a thriving system. You do not get such a diversity of clumps of mushrooms and fungi and moss and lichens if the system is dead. And also, it smells spectacular too. Wow, that, that does smell amazing. <laughs> it's so fresh. I know, it's the smell of a living system. And what do we do with this now? It's off to the lab to study what's in there now. ETH Zurich is one of the world's leading universities in science and technology. By taking soil samples and data from around the world, researchers at the Crowther Lab are studying microbial communities to find patterns between microbes and carbon storage. So what are we going to do with all the soil now? All right, so we're going to be doing three things. First, we're going to be putting it in the elemental analyzer to study how much carbon and nitrogen is trapped in that soil. We're then going to be extracting DNA from the sample to see how many microbes are in there. And then we're also going to be plating them out onto Petri dishes so that we can see them grow and interact and understand how they're locking away that carbon. So there's one fungus here growing in that direction. There's one fungus here growing in this direction. There's this line of interaction in the middle allowing them both to coexist. So if these two species were to coexist in a region, they would both persist together. That tells us a lot about how they would capture and store carbon and nitrogen in that system because if you've got a facilitative, collaborative, interactive network, you tend to get lots more carbon accumulating rather than the systems which are dominated by only one species that tend to be more depleted in those resources. To date, the Crowther Lab has learned how soils dominated by bacteria have a faster carbon cycle and release more carbon, whereas soils that are dominated by fungi trap more carbon for longer. And what's all this data going to show us? So what we ultimately need to understand is where all of these organisms are and how are they locking away all of that carbon so that we can understand how we can manage different ecosystems across the planet differently to maximize biodiversity and carbon capture. Dr. Laura Van Galen is a researcher looking at how fungi can be used to help restore the soil. So here we have some fungal species that we're growing in culture for um, an experiment. These are ericoid mycorrhizal fungi. These fungi, so they're the mycorrhizal fungi that connect with plants and give the plants access to extra nutrients that they can't get otherwise. And so they have a hugely important effect on plant growth. This is the same thing, but growing in liquid. So they form little balls. So those are little fungi balls. Yep. And then we take this and we blend it all up to use as inoculum. Mycorrhizal fungi form mutually beneficial relationships with plants. The fungi colonize the root system of a host plant, providing increased water and nutrient absorption capabilities, while the plant provides the fungus with carbohydrates formed from photosynthesis. Mycorrhizae also offer the host plant increased protection against certain pathogens. What we're interested in understanding is how the diversity of these fungal communities impacts plant productivity and therefore the ability of ecosystems to draw down carbon. So is the fungi a quick fix to regenerating the soil? Now, I don't want to suggest there's any silver bullets, but definitely fungi are one of the most critical components that we need to rebuild an ecosystem. The scientists here have analysed over 80 experiments to show that restoring the microbiomes of native soils can accelerate plant biomass production by an average of 64%. But there are other problems too. The most crucial ingredient for sustaining all forms of life is water. Yet the forces of climate change, such as increased temperatures, drought and floods, are disturbing natural cycles and threatening the delicate balance that keeps our soils healthy, fertile and alive. 
Wow, that's well hidden. Yeah, welcome to our forest laboratory in Zurich. Across the city, Dr. Marius Florianchic is leading an experiment to understand more about how water travels through forests and how these changing patterns are affecting ecosystems and underground microbial communities. Basically, when rain hits the forest, a lot of rain will be kept in the canopy and we can measure how much water is lost by these gutters that we have here. Um, another component we are measuring is the stem flow. The tree basically leads the water to its stem and it's a very nutrient enriched water source for the tree. So here we actually sample water from different depths uh, in the soil. So over 10, 20 and 40 centimeter depth, we get an estimate on how much water moves from each precipitation event through the different layers. We also take water samples from the different depths to understand a little bit how the chemical composition is changing and also how quick the water moves through the forest soil. It's very important, of course, that there's water in the soil for the microbial communities to thrive. And we're observing this in different layers to understand a little bit at which how many dry days in summer different layers are drying up. Marius is learning how this nutrient-enriched water can be held at the deeper levels of the forest floor throughout the year to support life in the dry summer months. Then we're also observing how different roots in different, that access different depths of the soil are taking up water. So we have sensors installed. Oh, and look, it's like a whole medical operation in here on the tree. Understanding these cycles and how long water can be stored in the soil will help us to adapt to the impacts of climate change. Then we also have these plot experiments where we just measure the water content with this organic litter layer and without this organic litter layer. Another key discovery for the researchers at ETH Zurich is that forest floor litter and decaying wood play a much more significant role in the forest water balance than previously thought. They found that these components retain and evaporate a fifth of annual precipitation. So what have we learned about soil health from all the work that you're doing here? I think it's very important um, to keep a lot of organic matter in the forest because this is key to build up uh, yeah, sufficiently storing soil. And this is something we definitely did wrong in the past decades. This is also one major aim of this overall project to find out how these different management strategies of forest impact these processes that naturally occur. There are many projects like this around the world, but in order to build global solutions, information sharing is key. The Forest Lab's data and findings are all made available via an online international resource known as Restore. Set up by Tom Crowther, it launched in 2017 as an engine for the Crowther Lab's bigger picture ethos. So what is Restore and how does it work? Well, Restore is like a Google Maps, but for nature. So instead of cities, shops and hairdressers, you can see national forests and also networks of sustainable farms in addition to globally standardized data sets about carbon, water storage in the soil, the microbial diversity of these ecosystems. We're also leveraging information from satellites that's provided to us through the likes of the European Space Agency and NASA to really democratize this information and provide it to, to communities on the ground. What kind of technologies are you using within the platform to get all of this data? Developments in science have now led to the point where we can take all of that um, huge, rich diversity of data that has been collected by ecologists over the decades. And by leveraging the latest in um, artificial intelligence and machine learning around the world, they're able to take those ground source data sets and correlate them with environmental variables, things like climate, precipitation, water storage in the soil. And they're able to create a prediction for any location on the planet of the health of that ecosystem. And only by taking this global approach can we start to understand the patterns in biodiversity. Can we start to see through the trends and identify the key areas that are required to conserve and restore in creating a more healthy planet. Why do you think this is a really important solution? Fundamentally, we're doing this because we don't believe that anybody wants to contribute to the damaging the rich variety of life on Earth. We want to create a world where every product we buy, every decision we make, is actually positively impacting nature. What we absolutely need to remember is that this is not going to be achieved by top-down governmental decisions. 
What we need is millions of local communities, farmers, indigenous populations, businesses working to promote healthy biodiversity for the well-being of people that depend on it. When people understand their ecosystems and the nature that they depend on, that is when nature thrives and people thrive with it. The greatest threat to the health of our soils is industrialised farming, using an intensive chemical-reliant process to maximise yields. This has been escalating since the Industrial Revolution, and it could threaten future crop harvests. So if you're cultivating your soils continually, what you're doing is you're breaking up the soil structure, and that leads to a lot of soil erosion. So literally, we're just physically losing soil out to sea. Soil erosion, compaction, acidification and chemical pollution are just some of the effects of these practices that are not only detrimental to the soil, but also to the consumer. You know, there is a direct link between cancer, gut and digestive health that is too glaringly sort of obvious to ignore. Here in Cornwall in the UK, Chef Dan Cox took on the 120-acre Crocodon Farm in 2017 embracing the practices of a growing movement of regenerative farmers. What was the original idea behind Crocodon and what you're doing here? As a chef, before I came here, there were certain things within my food supply that I had a lot of questions over. So, you know, my next step was to get onto a farm, take on a farm and sort of investigate each and every aspect of my food supply for a future restaurant. What's the difference between regenerative and organic farming? I mean, regenerative farming, people have taken it in many different directions, and I think that's the key to it, really. There's no real strong definition of what regenerative farming actually is, but if you take it to the basic level, yeah, you, you're trying to regenerate the land that you're a custodian of. You know, organic is pretty straightforward and easy to understand because it's a certifying body that has a set criteria, um, and one of those criteria is not using toxic pesticides. Crocodon is pitched as a soil-centric farm with a restaurant at its heart. For the past year, Dan's been hosting a creative fine dining experience, serving organic, homegrown produce and earning him a Michelin green star, rewarding restaurants at the forefront of sustainable practices. So we've got some pumpkins and stuff over there. Yeah, a little tiny squash on the floor. Yeah. Big arse show there, yeah. rhubarb in the middle. Shortly after acquiring Crocodon, Dan called on the support of Tim Williams, a pioneering figure in regenerative farming. Well, I would say regenerative systems, I would view them as organic plus plus. Hailing from the farmlands of New Zealand and more recently regenerating his own neighbouring Earth Barton farm, Tim has decades of experience marrying traditional farming knowledge with modern sustainable practices. Kind of instead of going into that negative spiral where you're causing damage to the soil as you're actually trying to repair that damage. So tell us what's going on here, Tim. Okay, so we're rotationally grazing cattle, so mob stocking. We move the cattle through the landscape on a daily basis. <laughs> it's all right, it's just licking you. It's just licking you. You like the taste of the city. Yeah. Um, um, to, Chick. <laughs> I mean, They're all so friendly. They are very friendly, yeah. <laughs> and I'm going to hear you. Yeah. And what, what role do the cows play? Uh, so they have several purposes. So the way that they migrate through the farm, so if you imagine the Great Plains of America, for example, the soils, the corn belt, were built through the migration of buffalo, working with the na native grasslands here. And that, that migration of the animals, which we're trying to replicate here, with electric fences instead of predators. Animal has evolved to have a very intricate relationship with the plant and the soil. So it sort of speeds up that soil building process. They control the photosynthesis in the plant. So when they graze, they're only really taking the tops off the plant. So the plant keeps growing, keeps photosynthesizing. Um, and then what they're consuming ferment in their guts and then concentrate that down into their dung, which then also feeds the soil biology as well. I feel like we've been told this narrative that cattle farming is really bad for the environment. So there's this kind of this misnomer around livestock and, and 
its impact on climate change. And I think we've still got to understand a lot more about methane emissions. The way with cattle is, is that they're cycling carbon. So, so they can only expel as much methane as they have consumed. So it's not like a fossil fuel where we're mining that and it's been released into the atmosphere. It's nuanced and complicated. Is it more expensive to farm regeneratively? No, it should be cheaper because you don't have any inputs. So on this farm here, we don't use any inputs at all apart from livestock and plants. Now you could reframe it and you could call it ecological farming. And instead of fighting it, putting chemicals on it and fertilizers on it, if we understand actually how this all functions and encourage it to function better, we can create healthy, nutrient dense food without damaging our environment. So while organic farming is regulated to stop inputs such as chemicals, regenerative farming goes one step further, with the added focus on improving soil health and the environment. But what does this look like in practice? Well, it's like a bank account. If you want to keep extracting, 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 you'll be in debt, there'll be no money, times will be hard kind of thing. If you, the more you put in in terms of organic matter, the more you leave on top in terms of a plant during pasture, the more diverse you make your arable crops. In this field is a cover crop. It won't be harvested, it's just grown to enrich the soil ready for next year's yield, eliminating the need for chemicals. So what's the aim of all this cover crop? One, fix nitrogen naturally. Two, accumulate phosphate. Three, pump uh, carbon into the soil and add complexity into the system, basically. So you want your soil to be nice and fluffy. So what should the really healthy soil look like? So it should be kind of like cottage cheese, that sort of crumbly texture, nice and porous, very aerated. One of the most important nutrients for plant growth is nitrogen, which in conventional practices would come from a bag. Which plants are the best for fixing the nitrogen? Is it a certain type of plant? The nitrogen fixing plants are called legumes. So legumes, clovers, um, peas are a legume, beans, legumes, gorse is a legume, even some trees are legumes. We've got a lot of nitrogen in the atmosphere, but it's not plant available. And there's an intricate relationship between the plant and the bacteria, and they capture nitrogen and they create these little nodules and then it will be left behind for the next crop. I mean, that's a lot of nitrogen. That is a phenomenal amount of nitrogen. Lots of life going on in here. One of the most important things in the soil is air. And the worms help with that. Yeah, exactly, because they create their own little channels for air and water. So what's going to happen next for this soil? Uh, so here we're going to flail this crop. It won't, we're not actually taking a crop off and all this plant material will return to the soil to feed the soil system. So you're re-engaging the soil networks, but you're also trying to create basically a blank canvas to start again. The three pillars of the Crocodon enterprise involve Dan the chef, Tim the farmer, and Claire the grower. So here we have a bit of a jungle of um, plants um, all working together in quite a permacultural type system. Smells amazing. Yeah, it's gorgeous, isn't it? Some of the plants coming up we haven't planted. They're wild plants that are coming back through. But, um, you know, we like to work in a system where we have um, companions working together. The hyssop, so this is this one here. And then we have some lovely rhubarb and fennel going to seed here, but we like to use every part of the plant. Delicious, and that's all used in the kitchen? Yeah, exactly, all used in the kitchen. And um, we put, so we keep adding to the soil with compost that we've made from the kitchen just to create this full cycle. So where's all of this going now? So everything, pretty much everything apart from perennial weeds is going onto our compost piles, which is gonna go back into the soil in about six months time. We're layering up the waste from the restaurant and the waste from the garden. We're trying to get the right balance so it basically gets the biology going. We'll leave it to rest for six months and then it goes straight onto the crop. So how's all this composting going to help? The composting with your own resources that you have on your own garden or in your own farm is directly going to put the right balance back into the soil. So here's some of the finished product. Look at that. Oh, full and, of worms. And what we're looking for is that beautiful, dark, um, rich coffee colour. And then we're looking for life, basically. As soon as the worms have moved in, it's pretty much ready. 
and all just made by us on the farm. How does the soil then affect the nutrients of the food that we're eating? I mean, with a healthier soil and with a functioning soil, you will see a higher uptake in micro and macronutrients into the crop that you're growing. It's just as simple as that. And those nutrients are basically flavour. You know, if the soil is healthy, the plants are healthy, then the humans that consume them are healthy. I mean, Mexican marigold. What does the Mexican marigold do? It's a couple of things. I mean, you see it's taller than me. Um, so anything with height like that is going to have roots that, again, sort of deep down, they're sort of tilling, they're aerating, they're finding new pathways, um, they're bringing nutrition up from deep down below, they're helping to feed the entire system down there with these big solar panels. And um, one of the other things about Mexican marigold is allopathic, so the roots actually smother out perennial weeds. So if you look after the health of the soil, you then shouldn't need all these fertilisers and pesticides. Is that the case? That's exactly it. You should just focus your energy on, yeah, feeding the soil in the right way and growing the plants that you want upon it. You know, the biggest thing would just be to embrace nature as a whole and try and work with it in the best way possible. So what's it like to have access to this kind of ingredients from a chef's perspective? Yeah, it's all I mean, pretty fresh. Wow, I mean, yeah, from a chef's perspective, it is, it's an absolute dream, really. I mean, to have produce, you know, grown with such care and attention um, that tastes so incredible, but also to be able to work with it so immediately and respond to each, you know, each change in the season and, you know, give that experience to our guests. What do you think is the future of regenerative farming? This is what we used to do. It's just about going winding the clock back and looking at how things were once done, but using all of the knowledge that's been gained in between to make it more achievable to return to that place of health for everyone. We can't continue to farm in the fashion that we farm in a conventional high input chemical system because the health of, our, of us as humans is in decline, the health of our planet is in decline. So it's a financial thing, it's a human health thing, it's a planetary health thing as well. It takes more and more chemical inputs to ensure that these systems work when, you know, just a short six months to a year of a diverse range of plants upon land will completely regenerate and have that soil functioning again. 100% of our economy, of our businesses, are dependent on nature. Many of us live in cities making hundreds of decisions every day and we have no idea about how the choices we make and the products we buy are actually impacting nature. We want to re-establish that connection to nature. Restoration doesn't mean one or two big conservation projects around the world. It means millions of local communities becoming economically empowered by the biodiversity they depend on. That is a global restoration movement. That's what we have to achieve.